Amen. Uh, welcome, and it's just good to see you here this morning. My name is Paco Amador. I am a, a local pastor. I'm a pastor here in the city of Chicago, New Life Community Church. It's, it's a multi-site church throughout the city, and I um, have the great privilege of ministering uh, for the Lord in uh, the Mexican neighborhood of Little Mexican immigrant neighborhood, not too far away from here. And, uh, so it is... It is my privilege to uh, lead us into the Word of God this morning for a short devotional. And so, Lord, we, uh, we expect greatly from you and we have great anticipation what you would speak to us, not just right now at this moment, but throughout the day, throughout our conversations, throughout our prayers, throughout our songs. Would you speak to us? Grant us the gift of your presence, transformative presence, even now to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen been thinking um, uh, a lot with a bunch of other people from our church several years, several months ago about uh, the last week of the Lord Jesus as described by uh, Luke. And so I want to invite you to go with me to chapter 19 uh, of Luke, verse, um, verse 37. Chapter 19, verse 37. This, of course, is a triumphal entry. And what I understand is that Jericho, Jesus was coming from Jericho where he had been hanging out with Zacchaeus. And as they are coming up from the mount, they, uh, I hear that Jericho is the lowest city in the face of the planet. And so they have to climb up way uphill. And as they are climbing up, they're going in the middle of the desert. This is the Judean desert. It's dry. It's, it's, it's dry is hot, but the, the pilgrims from all over the world are gathering there with, the, with Jesus, with the disciples. They are gathering together, singing the great songs of Zion. And as they are climbing up the mountain, then they get to Bethany, the birthplace of the apostle Peter. And then they climb up just a little bit higher. And when they finally get to the crescent, to the, to the crest, I'm sorry, to the crest of the top of the mountain, of the Mount of Olives, then the city of, the God, of God, the city of Jerusalem just comes into view. And have you ever climbed something real? I mean, something that was steep. If you've ever gone to the Aztec pyramids, I mean, these are like short little steps and really high up. By the time you get to the sun, uh, to, to the top of the, the sun pyramid or something like that, I mean, you're just saying, that. <laughs> and finally you get this amazing view. Well, this is exactly what was happening, I believe, with the disciples and Jesus and all of the other pilgrims. They are not just singing the songs of Zion, greeting each other. This is next year in Jerusalem, so now they're coming into, in, in, in up on the mountain. But they finally get to the top of the mountain. It turns green, it's lush, I hear, in spring. And, but not just that, they get to see the city of the king. Now... Next to them is Jesus, and he's sitting on the colt, and so everything comes into view for the disciples. And so they finally realize these are the prophecies. They are being fulfilled right in our midst, right here. Zechariah chapter 9 is the king, the glory of the Lord. is coming right into the city again. Would you go with me? Chapter 19, verse 37. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they have seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees, however, in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So all of a sudden, the disciples just explode in this amazing sense of worship to Jesus. They realize this is the salvation of the Lord. And I believe that throughout history, we have been granted, of all the people, we have been granted the great gift of living lives of joy. Growing up as a young man, in, as a young kid in Mexico, I remember that I felt that I was Latino. I was Hispanic all of my life. Until I had to walk into a Protestant church. <laughs> and then I, as for some reason, I was forced to, to become German and stoic and stand straight and listen to this thing. And then we would walk out of church and just go back to being Latin. And I feel like of all people all over the earth, believers, those who know that the king is in our midst, that the king is coming... We should, we have the great gift 
and the great joy of being the most joyful of people. Because the king is in our midst. Any amens out there? Amen. You know, the church out there is an amen church, isn't it? The church out there is a clapping church, isn't it? Because when you have found the king, I mean, you, you have all reasons to celebrate, to shout, to jump, to sing for joy. And there were some religious types that were, you know, saying, hey, could you keep it down? Of course, we have to grant some grace to the Pharisees because all this Messiah talk, you know, it's going to stir the Romans and we're all going to end up in trouble. And so let's keep it down. Would you shut your people? And Jesus says, I believe he's thinking, at least I'm thinking of Psalm 98. Remember that? Remember Psalm 98? The rivers would clap their hands and the mountains would shout for joy. Should Christians do any less? Just this exuberant joy and worship to God. Jesus says the, the stones would cry out, the stones would sing. I, I need to confess to you that, uh, you know, when I was reading this this last time, the first thing that came to my mind is, oh, man, we need to, we need to be people that are joyful people. Otherwise, otherwise, the stones will sing. And I'm thinking, I mean, I don't want to see Mick Jagger singing or dancing. Here's the thing. I mean, it's like looking at your great-grandpa in tights, man. It's like, that was a great band, but they should stay away, really tongue-in-cheek. Could it be that the Mick Jaggers of our world continue to have great celebrations because the church doesn't know how to celebrate loudly and joyfully. The king is in our midst, for goodness sake. We are called. We are not just called. We are invited to join with the rivers and the mountains and the stones to shout for joy. It's interesting. This amazing, joyful parade is walking into the city. But as they get right before the doors of the city, the Bible tells us that Jesus did something totally radical. Radical in the midst of the parade of joy. Have you ever felt kind of butterflies in your stomach and your belly as you're like approaching to do something that's way beyond you. Well, would you go with me? This is verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. I'll jump to the very end of verse 44. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. I've been thinking a lot about tears and the tears of Jesus. And if nothing else, tears tell you a lot about the people for whom they are being shed. Make no mistake. I mean, Jesus was, was being moved out of love for people that would in a few days be betraying him. He's not just crying for victims. He's crying for, for the perpetrators, for the, for the predators, the ones that would betray him. I think tears also say something very deep, especially ab about the person who sheds those tears. Jesus was being moved with amazing mercy. Even now, if only you, I wish that you would know the terms of peace for your life. He is envisioning, I believe, in 40 years, the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And messiahs would, be, would rise up and they would say, hey, I'll lead you out of this captivity. I, let, let's push the Romans out. And Jesus says to his disciples, don't you dare listen to them. They will sound like they're coming in my name, but don't you listen to them. No, you get out of this city and you run up to the mountains. You don't, don't try to be a hero. Don't try to stay here. The city of Jerusalem was raised to the ground. And Jesus, as he steps, as he's standing in the front of the, the door of the city, he looks at the city. He looks at the people that would crucify him and he weeps, weeps out of mercy. I have a good friend. Not too long, from, not too far from here. He's, um, he's a pastor. He's been a pastor for many, many years in the city. In a neighborhood that is very, very difficult. This um, Lawndale neighborhood is, uh, several years ago, is known as the top or the second most uh, dangerous neighborhoods in the entire, in our entire country. And 
And um, they call him coach. He's a pastor. They call him coach, though, because he led a bunch of young men from his uh, wrestling team many years ago and his football team and they, to the Lord. And they decided, these kids decided, let's start a church. And so that's a church that has made an amazing difference in that neighborhood. And I was talking to him one day and I was asking him, hey, coach, would you, would you give me a tool that I need as a pastor? I'm a younger pastor. Uh, what's one tool that I should have? And he said, you should learn to weep. You should learn to weep. He says this. It doesn't go by one week in, the, in, in, in my ministry where, where I don't weep bitterly sitting next to people. It's the devastation around us. He said, there's even a whole book in the Bible to teach us how to lament. So thinking about all these things together, a few months ago, there was a lot of shootings back and forth in our neighborhood. And this gang was shooting at the other gang in our neighborhood, shooting back and forth, several young men dead. And so one of the gang intervention guys in our church told me, hey, Pastor, would you come and pray at the site where one of the young men was killed? And so I went over, and uh, as I'm walking in, I'm, I'm seeing all these young gang bangers kind of walking in the same direction. And I'm wondering what's happening. And, you know, what's going on over there. And so when I get there, I ask somebody, I ask the young gang intervention guys from our church, hey, so what's going on? He said, is there a program? Is there some? No, 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 you're it. They're, they've all come to listen just to you. And so I'm thinking, oh, man, that's, that's a great responsibility. I run 60 or so young men and women just standing there, most of them involved in the grips of the gang. And um, so I said, hey, well, can I, can I say is there a program or can I say whatever I have in my heart? He said, say whatever, whatever the Lord puts in your heart, just go ahead and, and say that. So, of course, I meant to speak, to read some scripture and to pray some prayers. But as I'm standing in the middle of it, all these young men, young men and women, you see the hopelessness in their faces. Here's a young guy that was just killed two days ago. He was their buddy hanging out with them and now he's gone just like many others down the line and so guess who's coming down the line with them and so there's hopelessness in their faces and as I stand in the middle of the group I realize most of them are half my age which means that I am probably the age of most of their fathers and this heaviness came upon me that I felt like this was from God almost as if God was saying would you speak to them as if you were their father their own personal daddy and would you speak my words to them? And so I said, hey, I'm, I know that none of us are interested in hearing me speak in my own thoughts. But would you allow me to speak what I think that God is telling you? He has something to tell you. And I think he has something to tell you as if uh, through me, as if would you look at me as if I was your daddy speaking to you, your own father. And so I began. And. I looked at them and I said, my son, I, I'm sorry for not having been there when you were a little kid. Would you, would you forgive me for, for being at work all the time and never had time to kick the ball with you or go to your little kindergarten graduation or even making fun of kindergarten graduation? Would you forgive me for leaving your mom? Would you forgive me for living, leaving you? And I felt like as I'm speaking these words that are coming out of my mouth, but they're not mine. I've started weeping. I just, uncontrollably, I just, I just, I was taken over. And I'm, I'm weeping. And what happened was that all these hardened young gangbangers just broke down. It's just, everybody started weeping. Here I am in the corner of our neighborhood, a very unlikely church audience. And we're weeping together. So I finished. Normally, I just greet gangbangers like this, God bless you. Young men were coming to hug me. And I felt like there's a hunger out there for people to see the tears of Jesus moved out of mercy. You know, I learned something that day. I learned that the church has been called to be the joyful center of the world. The joy flows out of the church because we know that the king is in our midst. Amen. But at the very same time, I felt like I learned that throughout history, the Lord Jesus has been looking for people who would shed the tears of the king. Moved out of motivation. Out, the motivation being this mercy that burns within their soul. 
on behalf of others. My question is, I believe that God's question is, it's not who weeps in the city of Chicago. There's many people that weep in the city of Chicago. That won't change the city of Chicago. But who weeps on behalf of the city of Chicago? The Lord look at, looked at his prophet and he said, should I not be concerned? I want to be personally involved. Would you close your eyes with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us the greatest of reasons to sing. The greatest of reasons to laugh. The greatest of reasons to dance. The greatest of reasons to, to live lives of joy. At the same time, thank you for the great gift of your tears. Thank you because you shed those tears on our behalf, even when we do not know. And Lord Jesus, thank you because you have granted us even the gift and the joy of being able to shed tears on behalf of others. May, be we, may we wear those tears, not as a gimmick, but as, a, as an overflowing, outflowing of your heart into our world. May we be moved by what moves you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.